record it. Okay, morning, gents. How are we all? Good morning. I'm fine, morning. thank you. Welcome back. You're the, you're the first. You're the first guest to come on twice. Well, I, I I hope that's a good that's a good sign. I hope the <laughs> feedback from last time was was positive. I really enjoyed it as well as as Jorg uh, did. Unfortunately, he can't be here, but uh, yeah, we enjoyed it both very very much. It was interesting. Excellent, excellent. Good, well, we're, we're glad good afternoon, there. everybody. Mark, you fixed your technology issues. I did. Yeah, Granddad here had problems with the technology, <laughs> but he, he's fine now. <laughs> I don't know what you're laughing at, DeVos. You're not far behind me. <laughs> in age, yes. But in technology, no. I am light years ahead of you in terms of technology. <laughs> Jason's give you like that. Star Wars, mate. You, don't worry about it. <laughs> Jace, how are you, mate? I'm good, thanks, Mike. I'm good. Yeah, I, I'll echo uh, Jan's comments. I really enjoyed the last discussion and I actually wanted it to continue because it's uh, it's great when you get to to, to hear about the work that's being done in other parts of the world and and you find similarities to some of the challenges that you're faced with in your neck of the woods and then you you can try and apply some of the learnings from that experience to to overcoming your own challenges so yeah looking forward to, to diving in a little bit deeper on a few things uh on this call today for sure yeah and congrats on the uh the launch of the canada soccer podcast as well that's been yes fun. we 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 have a podcast it's been it's been long discussed and and long talked about but we felt uh now was a great time to to get it off the ground so the canada soccer nation podcast is live we've done three episodes the first three i've i've profiled each of my staff members Stuart neely dave nutt and jim lachlan to talk about the work that they do uh, this week, we've got uh, Carl Horton coming on from Richmond Hill Soccer Club. So he's going to talk about how the club has approached uh, the suspension of sanctioned soccer through the COVID-19 pandemic, how they're reaching out to engage with their staff, their coaches, their players, their parents. And uh, we'll have a good discussion about that. So looking forward to it. It's going to be really good. And then hopefully next week, we'll have a, a special guest on from the academic world. I still have to confirm that one, but uh, I'm excited about that as well because... As you all know, there's so much great work being done in the world of academia that is now starting to transfer to the, the grassroots game and the on-field experience. And linking those two together, which I know you, you've all talked about in the past before, I think that's a really important next step for the whole industry of grassroots football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And say, really say hello to the cat when you sit, speak to him then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Carl Carl is renowned as a goalkeeper, so we're, we're going to dive into that story and get a little bit, a bit of a background on him for sure. Cool. Well, Mark, do you want to um, uh, set up the uh, the context for the conversation? Um, again, I'm just picking up that little bit of echo. So I know, Mark, you're moving around. I don't know if it's you again, Grandad. Just be careful with uh, whatever you're moving. Um, okay, but I think it might be this. Okay, I think, well, the the seeds of this uh, this conversation we're about to have were sown after the last podcast when we stayed just in touch online for a few minutes afterwards and we started discussing, um, sorry, we started discussing um, just basic player development stuff, our own experiences. And, and uh, both Jan and Jason started... Uh, Speaking, Jason had a kind of an individual example, while Jan was on a more on a more national scale looking at player development. So I thought today we could um, bring both examples up, and with Jan's uh, work in t research into player development uh, pathways um, in Holland, and uh, Jason can give a good example of an individual Canadian soccer player who's. Oh, Hitting the hitting uh, the heights and in the international scene at the moment. So uh, maybe we could start with you, Jan. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mark. And and indeed, it was funny that after the the last uh, time we spoke and we we uh, we hung out for a couple of minutes, then actually we were again seeing all these similarities between the work uh, Jason is doing and and we are doing within the Dutch FA and you guys are doing in a club setting as well. Um, yeah, so so basically, I think that the last couple of years, uh, we, the Dutch FA, are yeah really critically looking at our 
youth developmental system which is in place. Um, I, I think that um, it's often quite easy to, to look at your system and say, okay, well, look at all these players uh, that, that have come out of, of, of our, our, um, our national developmental pathway, our, our system we, we, we have in place. And say okay, it 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 works. Look at look at all these these players. But yeah, I think that um, and there's a really nice paper by by Richard Bailey. I, I think I mentioned it last time as well that it's actually an optical illusion. And I really like the the quote uh, you always mention, Mark, where you say okay, throw a, a a basket of eggs against the wall, and yeah, some 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 will will be uh, uh, won't break. And you use that as an evidence that your system is 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 working, and and you don't look at all the broken eggs, uh, which you obviously don't see ending up in your your system anymore. So um, we have a fairly uh, detailed player registration system within Holland. Um, we got uh, almost uh, we got more than one million active members and they are all registered within the FA so we can on a fairly detailed level actually look at where they are playing when they started playing at which level they are playing and for the last couple of months I've been uh, yeah, using this data to to actually see okay what are the actual turnover numbers within our academies what is the actual entry age of players uh, making it to the senior level and yeah, I, I I think it is now maybe four or five years ago that I that I read the study of Arne Gullich in which he did a similar kind of analysis for the German uh, Bundesliga players. And yeah, we're we're just trying to see if we can we can do these same types of analysis for the Dutch system. And then I I think that you are actually looking at your system and and asking these questions like. Okay, is this really what we what we are aiming for, and and is this the most efficient, or maybe the most appropriate and necessary system in place to develop youth athletes, youth youth football players? And we're coming to the conclusion that it might not be, and that we might um, need to, uh, yeah, in the most extreme case, break the wheel and and seek if we can come up with with other uh, uh, systems in place. So it was a fairly long answer to, to your question, but that's the uh, that's the status right now. Yeah, mm. I, th I think um, what's interesting there, and it's a very important point, and I, I know we we probably touched on it the last time we spoke, is that it's all fine and well looking at other systems successful, and even the evidence of say another system of of Germany or England or whatever another country. But really, it's the important thing is doing the research in your own environment. Yeah, to yeah. to create your own knowledge, that's what's really really important. Because while it's easy to take ac academic research from one country, or easy to take, hey, this model in country X is brilliant. Let, let's use that. We also, you know, we we really need to um, respect the uh, social, uh, sociocultural, historical constraints uh, of 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 our country, and, uh, your or the country you're in. And I guess that's what you're essentially doing is investigating your own environment yeah. to create your own knowledge. Yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely. And and then with, with the numbers we, we have right now, and we have them analyzed, we have the data analyzed, and we're just, and I think it, it was mentioned by Kevin Till in his, in his latest presentation for iCoach Kids as well. And we're now thinking, okay, actually, who do we, who does get the opportunities? And, and more importantly, who, which players don't get the opportunity? And we see uh, uh, yeah. one of the one of the major mm -hmm. things we see is the relative age effect. Uh, yeah. Obviously, yeah. we 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 miss a, a, a big part of of players born later in the in the selection year. And then again, is is the 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 early specialization system we have in place with our with our academies is this actually necessary and appropriate to to develop players um, probably not the data shows that well again we have the the uh, fairly high turnover within teams so a lot of players dropping out or being deselected a lot of players new players coming in uh, we see that 
actually among the, the senior players, there's an over-representation of, of late side entries. So players who actually got in the uh, academy system on a, on a later age, let's say 13, 14 years of age. And probably when, when you're selected on, on a younger age, you, the, the, the chances are higher that you will uh, leave the system on an earlier age as well. So yeah, these are just, I think, major findings for us to, to critically assess what we are doing. Yeah. And what do you think you will do with the data? Do you think that this is, could be useful for maybe coach education? Yeah, no, no, definitely. Uh, we need to educate the people who are uh, who are working within these academies, within these clubs. Um, maybe not say that um, this is wrong and sh you should do it the other way, but mm -hmm. give them insights and, and give them um, insights into uh, into what they are doing because. We we often tend to have a to have a survivorship bias and look at the ones who who make it. And I think by by broadening the the picture for them, not only looking at the 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 ex who didn't break, um, will give them some insight into oh yeah, this is actually what what our system is 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 yeah. producing and also uh, not not producing. So yeah, definitely coach education is one. Um, one of the, the the good things I think in in Holland is that clubs can work fairly autonomous, so we can't regulate or, or well, it's it's difficult to regulate it in in some way. So actually, we try to help clubs get the discussion started. Well, uh, I think uh, Bastian from from Willem II, he was uh, he was on on this podcast as well. Uh, he's one uh, professional academy that actually looked at, at at these numbers and say okay this means that we have to make other decisions other choices and 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 that's i think the 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 best way so actually let let people at the clubs uh, from the bottom up uh, change the the system to make it more appropriate and and so yeah. you you would also encourage even individual clubs to start investigating their own environment as well yeah yeah because it's as mentioned it's it's so easy to only look at the end product and say okay mm -hmm. Look at all this, uh, this, 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 uh, this money we got for these, uh, for for our players or the players mm -hmm. we we developed. Uh, and I think that the picture is is bigger, and we should we should actually um, should not be afraid of of uh, only looking at this this linear relationship, but embrace the nonlinearity. And and it, it it isn't. I mean, it isn't uh, someone's fault. Those those players are are being deselected, or they drop out, or they didn't make it. Um, you should you should actually embrace it and and look for for ways to to do it uh, in a more appropriate in a more appropriate way. Yeah. So and I'm gonna in some ways I'm just kind of gonna knock the ball over the net into into Jason's uh, part of the court here. This idea of of investigating your own environment and then surely coach education also needs to be very contextual as well i yeah, think I, would you think I, would you agree jason yeah 100 percent, mark i you know i think that was one of the first things that we really had to look at is what are we trying to do here you know what is it what is it that we feel needs to stay what can we keep what works um what what do we just need to tweak and, and slightly change and then the, the harder part is, what do we have to completely stop doing and then, you know, reinvest in in doing the right thing? And, and coach education was was certainly one of the areas that we felt uh, could be tweaked. But we also had to create um, new educational opportunities for coaches, specifically for those who are working with developing children and youth players. Because we never had anything like that. We, we had, you know, the traditional performance stream, which is C license, B license, A license, which is, you know, I think every FIFA member association has a similar type of a, a an elite performance pathway. But we never had anything for coaching seven-year-olds or 10-year-olds or 14-year-olds. Uh, we never had any specificity in our coach education program around male and female and the difference between their development process and the timelines on their development and understanding that. So you know, that was really where we felt we had to go. And, and you know, we looked around the world to see what best practice looked like and, and, and what other nations were doing. But 
ultimately we had to create something that was uniquely ours, that really reflected our culture, our reality. Uh, we talked about this on the last podcast, the, the, the vast geographical distances that exist between our, our cities and our provinces. So, you know, we had to personalize it for lack of a better term. And, and, and that was an important component of, of, of what we needed to do. But again, I think discussions like this are, are really valuable, valuable because when I listen to Jan talk about the challenges that they're trying to overcome, they're the same challenges that we're trying to overcome just in a, in a different context. But there's a lot of similarity there, I think. I think it's really interesting what you said there to start, Jason, about when you were like looking at kind of, OK, what do we keep? What do we change? What do we manipulate a bit, maybe add, you know, improve on? A little. And that, as, when I was over with you and Mike and we were doing the children's license, that was more or less what you would say to the coaches. They go out doing their sessions and their own self-assessment is, OK, what would you keep? What would you change? What would you build on? So it's quite quite a consistent view there. Yeah, and, and and I think that's always a good process to follow when you're when you're working with a coach and and working in a sort of a mentoring role, because oftentimes you think about your own your own time as a coach, your own time as a player. You know when you've played well, you know when you've not played well, and you're probably your own worst critic. And and most you know former players when they transition into coaching, they're the same. They beat themselves up, and they are they're already thinking about the mistakes that they made. So. You know, you think about how how you as an individual like to receive feedback. I've never met anyone that likes to be told what to do. I've never met anyone that likes being criticized. Um, it's it's generally not the right approach to take. So when when you ask those very open questions, how do you think it went? What did you like? What would you do differently? What would you change? Oftentimes you ask those three or four questions you're going to get the answers that you were going to give them. But if it mm. comes from the coach, it's a lot more impactful because they're having that uh, that reflection time and that re that retrospection, uh, for lack of a better term. So I think that's a, a big component of, of, of what we need to do. But if you don't if you don't work with your coach developers to train that and, and to give them an opportunity to experience that, I mean, you went through the process with with me, Mark, when when you did a session in Halifax, uh, in Nova Scotia, on the children's license. It was a really good session. It was quick, but it was a good session. And then the next day, to, to show the coaches on the course what that debrief process looks like, you and I went through that process. And it was a great conversation. And I just asked you very simple questions and then got all the information that I wanted to get out of you but it made you reflect back on your session the, the previous day. And I think that that changed the perception of coach development and coach mentorship with that specific group of coaches. Um, I know that we've got smart people in our country and, and it's, I'm sure it's the same in Sweden where you are, in the Netherlands where Jan is, in the US where Britain is. You know, I know, because I've met them. I've met the phenomenal people working in the game in our country. What we have to start doing more of is sharing the responsibility of developing coaches who by extension will create environments where players will evolve and, and emerge. I, I hate that term, I produced this player or or I my club produced this player. You, you don't produce, it's not a manufacturing line. It, it's not like an assembly plant. It doesn't work that way because you can follow the exact same process and get uh, an international uh, superstar, and you can get follow the same process and get a player that never makes the grade at the professional level. So, you know, this notion of producing players, I, I think we've got to try and stay away from that. It's more about creating environments for them to flourish and for their, you know, abilities to to fulfill to the maximum potential. And that's going to be different for every kid uh, as well. Jace, on um, on I've got a question for Jan as well. But on on the context of uh, where you just left there, um, how? Because obviously culturally in Canada we've got roles that are technical directors, and even that role, that professional, is uh, we're in this process really of still investigating and 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 engaging in what that role consists of. Because you're talking very clearly, that it's around you know. We, we need to spend more of a focus on educating coaches. Where do you think we're at with that 
perspective nationally? Do you think that this this was still a a way to go with understanding the role of a club and the, and the fact that they actually the leaders of the club support the coaches, not necessarily directly the players. And the technical director in resort, their responsibility is to basically oversee the education of the coaches and not coach a set group of players and vice versa. Where do you think we're at with the culture of Canada? Because my experience is it's still very, very um, misunderstood that when you're hired as a TD, you are basically the expert of developing players. And really, it's not. It's the opposite. Yeah, it's a fascinating one. It's it's um, I've, and I've delivered this presentation uh, across the country in, in, in one form or another. Form or another. What, what we what? don't have is a really clear understanding of what the technical director's job actually is because it's never been defined by anyone. So, you know, if you if you don't define a job and, and what the requirements are to do that job, you can't really hold anyone accountable to doing the job because no one really knows what it is. Mm. Uh, and, and that's the difficulty. If you, you know, if you look at every technical director job description in our country, you know, it's essentially a, a senior leadership position that's responsible for the club's overall technical direction. But when when you when you read through the actual job description, there's a whole bunch of things that jump out at me, you know, and, and there's a whole bunch of skill sets that jump out at me that are, are not really, um, you know, uh, looked for or, or trained or developed in our existing coach education program. I mean, every TD job looks for, well, you, you must have an A license or a B license. Mm -hmm. But the skills that you need to actually be a technical director in, in our country, in our reality, are not taught on a B license or an A license. Correct. So things like technical leadership, strategic planning, understanding governance, uh, human resource management, developing people, uh, uh, child and youth development principles, player and coach development principles, understanding finance and budget and how to balance a, a, um, you know, a budget from year to year, how to plan a, a budget. None of that's getting taught on a coaching course. Coaching course. You know? So you, you look at that and say, you know, the, the analogy that I often use is having a coaching license, having a formal education as a coach is important. It's a bit like baking a cake. You need flour to bake a cake. So you have to have that. But in order to make the cake delicious, you have to have a whole bunch of other things that, that is going to make it appealing. And I think most technical director candidates are missing those other things because they've never been asked to have them. They've never been asked to develop those skill sets. And the best technical directors are the ones who have acquired those um, those skill sets through different avenues, either through a formal education, going to university, getting a degree, uh, through informal education, working with mentors, working with really intelligent people in, in, in those areas of specialty where they've picked up those skill sets. You know, these are things that we need to start formalizing and developing and, that, and that's going to help give our technical directors the skill sets they need to take their job performance to a new level. Yeah, I, just to, I agree. I was just going to just going to add to that is, um, you know, I've been in this position of uh, a lot of ambiguity and, you know, how do we approach this? And I, I think in, in our culture, coaches uh, almost view it as they have their team and they own their team. So you're you're trying to help mentor them through something that they own, and uh, in some cases, you know that threatens you know how they do things and their you know their prior experience. But uh, yeah, I think I've spent more time on the phone uh, receiving you know parent complaints than mentoring coaches. And yeah, I think it's it's probably really important that we start to we start to define what those boundaries are. That's a good point, Britton. I think a lot of technical directors that I've spoken to, they love being on the field. They love working with with players. And the reality is, and and this reality is is exacerbated the hot the the bigger your organization is, is you can't coach every player in your club. You know, imagine mm -hmm. if you have a club of a thousand players, or two thousand, or five thousand in in some cases. It's impossible. There's not enough hours in the day. You just can't coach all the players. And the only way that you're going to make your your program successful is by coaching the coaches and 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 developing the people who are delivering your program on your behalf. 
So if you have 50 coaches that you're working with, you can develop 50 coaches. Um, that's a that's a, a skill set that that should be in every technical director's job description is coach development and then acquiring the skill sets and and going through the formal education process to acquire those skill sets is, is an important piece of their job. And if we look at this as well, Jace, I mean, if you don't have those tools, you can't in theory do what Mark was referencing in, in to investigating your own culture because you're just in the weeds, you're on the pitch, you're not looking at the bigger picture and how the, everything influences everything around you. Yeah. Um, and I kind of want to just link that back, if you don't mind. Jan, what was some of the, um, you know, going into it, I'm sure you had some uh, assumptions in when you were investigating the, the culture and the, the, the play development um, uh, approach there in the Netherlands. You probably had some ideas of what you were going to see. But what was what was in there that surprised you? Is there any data in there that you were like, oh, didn't expect that? Um, or was it pretty consistent with what you probably felt? You just needed the data. Um, well, one thing actually that uh, and, and that there was a good point that, that Jason made um, is there were there were so many different pathways you could uh, distinct from the data. So although there seems to be some correlation and there seems to be some average age in which certain players uh, either drop out or, or get into the system, but well. It's it's made up of so many unique developmental pathways that that I was just yeah I was just thinking okay how can we actually from an FA perspective make some recommendation about a certain pathway you should try to uh, uh, or you could try to to follow I mean there are so many there are so many players and every uh, player uh, uh, did have his own uh, unique, unique pathway. So, yeah, that was something I think that that struck me the most. That we we have this system in place, and and indeed, as Jason also mentioned, we're talking too much about producing or fabricating players, or or try. It, it's it's my player, and I need to make uh, revenue out of out of that player. Um, but there were there were just so many so many pathways which you could distinct from the data that I think that yeah in, in some way you you might even um, uh, not have a system in place at all and just make sure that that for every unique individual for every unique player you have that appropriate learning environment in place that. Uh, that that makes sure that that they can thrive and eventually end up at the level they they uh, uh, yeah that they, they end up and and can 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 make sure that they reach their full potential. That's that's I think the 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 uh, that struck me the most when when I looked at when I looked at this this data. Mm. And I mean, if we're thinking about like educating, um, uh, maybe it's not educating, it's engaging the, the stakeholders that are responsible for developing players. What's the next step? What's the strategy now that you've got this data and this research? Because obviously there's going to be a lot of individuals that might, you know, uh, push back and it might even be a healthy debate. Um, yeah. What's your approach to trying to get that conversation flowing? Yeah, I th I think that, uh, just getting the conversation uh, going is 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 step one. So just go and and talk to people and and try to to view their uh, uh, perspective and look at look at the data from their perspective. But I think the um, the best way uh, we we are aiming for right now is to really get get started from the bottom and just just work with grassroots clubs and help them uh, do things different in a different way uh, um, and, and let the cream rise to the to the top so let really from the bottom up try to try to make make adjustments to the system help uh, uh, help people working within youth football uh, your your discussion about the, the technical director and actually, his job is indeed to to educate coaches, and and within Holland you 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 have these these volunteer coaches, and you you also got some coaches who maybe have gotten some sort of education. And I think the the most important job for for those people is 
help help them just help them out with the questions they have on the field on a, on a regular basis and um, yeah really really start from the bottom working working upwards and try to to get as many people as possible uh, into into the message you you would like to uh, to to spread but yeah not not force it in 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 any way because that probably won't work yeah, I mean, it's that word. It's the difference between educate because it feels like it's been pushed at you and engage. Yeah, just yeah. engage them, and then maybe the dynamic would change. I think, Mark, I don't know if you feel like it's the right time, but probably, you know, with Jan talking about different pathways, you know, that data screaming at uh, uh, at them in the Netherlands. I mean, we have uh, a myth example really around a um, uh, star really in the making right now with uh, Alfonso. Jace, do you want to like, because it's funny, like everyone's got an assumption of what Alfonso's path was. Um, but really, I mean, a lot of people are misinformed and it kind of links in quite nicely to to um, really a lot of it, the unstructured environment that he was playing in. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. And, and Alfonso is a, a rising star. I mean, he has everything that you would look for to be a, a, an international star. Uh, his, his athleticism is off the charts. Uh, his, his ability to, to grow and develop and, and uh, meet the challenges of each new environment that he's presented with is, is phenomenal. Um, but I think it's dangerous as well to, to look at one individual example of a player who, who has gone on a pathway. And I don't even like the term pathway. Because yeah. it implies if you put someone else on that same pathway, yeah. they're going to be the same thing at the end. And that's not the reality. So I, I do think it's a little bit dangerous. And, and this is where I, I say to parents all the time, your child's journey through football is unique. It's not going to be what Alfonso Davies' journey was. It's not going to be what Christine Sinclair's journey was. It's going to be unique to them as an individual because they're an individual human being. And if if they don't make the, you know, all star select super World Cup under eight team when they're seven years old, that doesn't mean they're not going to reach the professional level of the game or play for their country or get a scholarship or play at a very high competitive level or most importantly, fall in love with football. Um, you know, I think that's the, the the common underlying theme. But, you know, when we examine, you know, player pathways and, and players getting to the highest level of sport, there are some commonalities there. And, and Jan referenced uh, Arna Gulick's work and, and research there. And obviously he's doing that research now as well. You do start to see some common trends. Um, one of them being that they've suffered setbacks somewhere along the way. Somewhere along the way, they've been told they're either not good enough or something has happened in their lives that was an obstacle that they had to overcome. And, and what, what we find is that the, the commonality is they had a network around them, whether it's family, whether it's friends, whether it's a, a coaching community or a club community that supported them while they went through that challenge. And they never lost their love of the game. That, that's the common underlying theme that I see with, with every professional player, every national team player. Uh, the, the biggest challenge, I've said this before, the biggest challenge with the national team is getting the players off the pitch at the end of a training session because they just love to play and, and they want to play the game. So managing their load is a real challenge. And, and you know, you look at someone like Fonzie, he's gone through, you know, incredible life challenges where he was a refugee and then he he, he emigrated to Canada and, and you know, he, he was able to, you know, find an environment in Edmonton where he fell in love with the game. And he had clubs around him that supported him through that process. And, and when the next challenge came to, to go to a higher level and, and, and to move home and join uh, the Vancouver Whitecaps, you know, he had a support network around him. And that included the club. It included his family. It included his friends. Uh, and he had to adapt to that. So, you know, and then from that point, he got into the first team and then he started playing at that level and obviously started to garner some some international uh, interest for sure. He made the step up to the national team and, and with every challenge that was put in front of him, he was able to adapt and, and, and assimilate to that challenge and that level and then thrive and then start to show his qualities. So, you know, those are the things that I think we should be looking at, not he was in this environment at this age and that's what you need to do. 
it's more about understanding that he was presented with a challenge. He adapted to that challenge. He overcame that challenge. And then he sought to excel at that level and the next level. And, and that's the process that I think when we talk about, um, you know, what process does a, does a young player need to go through to reach a higher level of the game? That process of meeting an obstacle, adapting to the obstacle, overcoming the obstacle, obstacle, and, and succeeding, and then seeking out the next higher level. That's that's the process that I think we need to need to take into consideration with all players, not just with our national team players, but players at every level of the game. Because the reality is, if we focused all of our energy just on producing national team players, we would do a disservice to the overwhelming majority of players that play our game. We've lost Jace. Wow. I think once we... we once we get him back, we'll um, let him finish. But we'll, uh, I think, the, whilst we do that, Britain, welcome, mate. I know you've contributed. You uh, slept in, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, just a little bit. No, we. Uh, I got to my computer and I realized that everything downstairs was unplugged. We're remodeling, and then I had to install Teams. And <laughs> yeah. It's, it's Sorry, start. Mike. I'm back. I, I don't know what happened there. I probably it was probably the uh, the mute button I should have been hitting. <laughs> Is Mark <laughs> still there? You're in ability to adapt to the technology, Jason. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've Sorry, overcome Jason. the challenge, Mark, and I'm back <laughs> now. So there you good go. man, well, you'll be stronger for it. No, I, I, I really like. I think that you say some important things there. Um, the the idea of um, support and challenge, kind of meet, meeting meeting the, uh, the support and, and the challenge. Because to overcome challenges, you need support. But yes. also too much, too much support maybe is not good. Too much challenge is not good either. I mean, this idea is, yes, we, we, have, we know a lot of these uh, uh, top athletes probably had some challenge in their life, but so did most that didn't reach the top mm, yeah. so uh, the, the problem is is when people design in these challenges or deliberately place challenges or if the structure itself is such a challenge that it's based on e inequality like what what Jan was touching on there with relative age effect and the selection and deselection maturity rates so there are basically challenges embedded and built into the system yeah that are just being accepted as as the norms, as just the way it is. And the support needed to overcome them, I think, really can go back to a very sound coach education, um, not a, pro, a program, if you want to put a coach education syllabus, whatever you want to call it, which is mainly taken, say, as I said to Jan earlier, you know, there you have you probably have da great data now to use in your um, coach education. So I think that it's about it's about support and challenge and not forcing the challenges on because we we we're going to face challenges in life anyway. They 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 emerge naturally, but unfortunately, yeah. many of these environments force them already yeah. on young people. Good good question, Mark. I I I would like to to indeed ask the same question to, to Jason uh, because I, I, I agree with, with the commonalities you found within these players that they should overcome some kind of obstacle but I'm really uh, struggling with if we should put those, uh, those obstacles uh, explicitly within uh, the journey of a player as, mm. as coaches yeah. or, or as, as an FA or that because in in a way it doesn't really yeah putting these obstacles in in place i'm i'm just not sure i, I think there's a paper uh, um, written by by dave collins that actually you should try to put these these bumps into the into the road but it doesn't really feel no natural to 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 just say okay i'm going to leave you on the bench now for three weeks and see how you cope with that it, it i agree with mark that is re you really need to carefully design in these these obstacles but yeah, they, they, those, sorry jason those challenges could be designed into training sessions as well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
I think that's the skill and the craft of coaching. It, yeah. You know, the, the challenge you you face as a coach is, uh, and this is the same challenge that parents face. If you snowplow all of the obstacles out of the way, how is your child ever going to deal with with with, with adversity in their life? You know, when they when they get you know that first brick wall that they come up against in life, and they've never had to scale a brick wall before, they'll they'll not know how to do that. And and we see that sometimes with players too. If 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 they go they, they go into an environment where they never have to overcome adversity, the first time it shows up in a game, they don't know how to do deal with it. Uh, and 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 so it's a I think it's a balancing act. Do do I think we need to um, you know artificially create those? I, I would agree with you, Yan. I'm I'm a little conflicted by that. Yeah. I think they will. I think they will emerge naturally. Uh, and they will emerge as challenges. And, and you know, again, I, I go back to just my understanding from a personal perspective of, of those who are fortunate enough to reach the highest level. I, I do see a burning desire to reach the highest level and to be the best. And I don't I don't believe that that is something that was um, produced by a coach, that, that the coach made them that way. I think that that characteristic emerged out of the environment that they were in and, and that includes their, their home environment how they were raised by their parents it includes their school environment the, the challenges that they've had to overcome in school it includes their footballing environment w what was the environment like for them in training every day what was the competition like and, and I go back to you know again my own my own journey because it's the only one that I have and it's the one that I know best but I had an older brother who was 13 months older than me who he was the bar. He was the, he was the one that I was always competing against to try and be better, to be better than him. Uh, and that was my that was my childhood. So from a very young age, I had that desire to to overcome challenges and obstacles. And man, if I look back on it, I had a whole bunch to overcome. But but I managed to, to, to do it because it was ingra ingrained in me. It was intrinsic. It, there was no external motivation. It was, I just want to be better. So I, I think, how can we, I asked the question, how can we create more environments where that intrinsic motivation naturally flourishes? That's the big, big challenge for all of us as leaders. I've had these discussions with coaches recently because they've been speaking a lot. For some reason, there's a big buzzword going around like resilience. And it's not, it's as if you ha you I, I as a coach can give you resilience or you're given resilience or your own resilience and it's it's not really like that it's it's just an, it's an inter it's kind of what you're touching on Jason it's it's a reciprocal interaction between individual and environment over time and how it's developed just because you're resilient on the football pitch doesn't mean you're resilient elsewhere in life yeah. but to be a resilient learner in football I would think that a lot could can do with the design so if you're wondering why your players you know, if you're looking for players to show more resilience, then designing opportunities for this, meaning that in sessions, there's a ball, an opponent, there's a direction and there's a consequence. And the consequence being that if you lose the ball, the opponent can possibly score. So that, that I, I'm really a big believer in, in that if you want to design it in. But again, we shouldn't confuse resilience on a football pitch with resilience off a football pitch. And I'm very much in agreement with you guys that I think there is enough challenges already embedded in systems and in daily lives of young people at the moment that we and if you look at social media, et cetera, the like culture, the badge of being nine and being in an academy and being on Instagram. I mean, there's yeah, with there's 10 and 11 year olds playing in academies with, with you know, living on likes and, you know. Uh, Instagram followers. So these things are also challenges. Think about so, now. Yeah. If, if if our kids now have not been given a challenge, I mean, the world's in lockdown. You know that in itself is a massive challenge. Yeah, to it's overcome. a huge challenge for them. So yeah. the, the, you know those that are uh, had kind of the same attitude and mindset as Jason will 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 come out of this. Um, you yeah, know, but there has to be a balance of support there as well. And we're correct. Back to over supporting is not good either so it's this balance i i think that that is very important and but forcing i think the structures we already have create enough um challenges for young people anyway and it's our on it's our job as coaches to know when to support and when to just let the challenge 
run its course and kind of guide them through a little bit, you know? Yeah. It, it comes Very down cool. to that. It comes down to that point again that the, the general consensus of coaching is, is there's a fear of we have to fix people. It's that reduction but, approach when the reality is they have to go through that. They have to go through that, that, that moment of, you know, quote unquote failure. Um, even it, like, you know, even if that word exists, cause you're learning all the time, we're frightened of that. And I think that comes back down to our coach education <laughs> programs. I, I have a question for Jason. What sort of teams was Afonso playing with when he was 10, 11 or whatever age he, he started? Playing, he's, he was playing with his mates in Edmonton. He, he, had, okay. he played for some club teams there. And, and you know, again, I, I don't know enough about his journey and through that program. I don't know the, the individual coaches personally. Um, so I can't comment on, on what that was like. But, um, you know, I, I think... You, you you raise a, a a really good point there. Um, you know, it's about understanding people, isn't it? I mean, I think all all coaching is is it's a it's a relationship industry. It's a relationship business, and and you have to have a deep understanding of people. And and I've been very very fortunate in in my career so far to work with our national team coaches. And when you when you watch them work with people, like you could literally just sit back and just admire the, the deep under that they have of how players tick and what motivates them and and the thought and the detail that goes into the individual meetings that they have with players and which buttons to push and which buttons not to push and and what will motivate one player won't motivate another player it, it's that understanding and i think if we can apply that same uh, type of an approach and care to grassroots football imagine imagine how many more players we could excite uh, about the game how many more of them would fall in love with with being a footballer and, and stay engaged for as long as possible? Uh, you know, to, to, to go back to your old phrase, Mark, as, as many as possible, as long as possible, as good as possible. Uh, if we can do that, then I think we're making real progress in player development and coach development because we have more people committed to creating great environments for young players. Very good. Yeah, because kind of my, my question about, about Alfonso was that really do there is a, there is a big myth i think in in youth sport that the best must play with the best with with the best coaches as early as possible and i'm i'm very i don't think that's necessarily true i think that's a very reductionist view yeah, of it's, a very it's, complex process it, it is a complex process 100% and i think if you if you look at the numbers, and this is where I'm, I'm keen to, to get a, a first gl a glimpse at Jan's research. Uh, if, you, if you look at the numbers and you look at the data, the amount of players that don't succeed from a best with best environment is, is, is far, far in excess of those who do succeed. So, you know, saying that that is the reason they succeeded, I think that is reductionist. Yeah. And I think yeah. we have to think bigger than that about the whole system not just about putting the best seven-year-olds on a team together, because that might not be why they make it, for lack of a better term, when they're 17, a decade down the road, and they've gone through so many physical and emotional changes over that period of time. We can't tell you for certain, with any level of certainty, that because they were on the under-seven all-star team, that's why they're turning professional now. Uh, it does. I don't think it works that way. No. Uh, just to add to that, uh, the, the point Jason made about the love of the game and intrinsic motivation, I think that that's so important. And, and it might be the case that playing with, with, uh, with your mates who are also very good at the age of eight may, makes you feel competent. But it can also be the case that you want to play with, with your mates who are not in your club, but you feel related to them, or you want to play in a team which which you have the feeling of, of autonomy. So I think it is indeed very complex and, and we should really stimulate that intrinsic motivation, that love for the game, especially in these, these early, early years. And it might be the case that, it, 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 that, that the thing that keeps you going is playing on a really high level, but it can also be the case as, well, obviously this case of Afonso Davies is that just playing with your mates uh, uh, gets gets the love of the game going and gets your intrinsic motivation going. So I think it is indeed very reductionist to say that there's a causation between playing with the best eight-year-olds on your team will eventually make it uh, make you 
uh, make your, your journey to the top. Mm. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else, fellas? Um, I think, <clears throat> you know, kind of going back to this idea of fabricating adversity and, you know, it, that's that support and challenge point. But, uh, you know, if you're the source of this fabricated adversity, what does that do for relationships? And what does right. that do for the love of the game? And what does that do for, uh, you know, kids feeling a part of, you know, wanting to continue really? Mm. So uh, really good points. I think really good points there. Yeah. Very good. Right. So Jan, just I think a question maybe to wrap this up. When when do you think your research will be uh, out and available um, to your coaches? Obviously, your 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 uh, uh, federation first, and then because yeah. um, I'm sure there's going to be people from the Netherlands listening and probably curious to see that. And then uh, I guess when can can other people have a little sneaky peek as well? <laughs> Well, I'm 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 more than happy to to uh, to share uh, these these figures with with anyone who's interested. I think uh, the point Mark made at the beginning, we have to be careful at uh, looking at these numbers and say it is applicable to anyone's situation. Um, so there has to be, and I'm more than than willing to do that. There has to be some sort of context and some sort <clears throat> of explanation, actually. How, what, do the, what do these numbers say? But m probably more importantly, what do they, what don't they say? And, and what information is still lacking? And what do we actually don't know yet about, um, about how players went from their, from their journey and, and, and the way to the top? So I think we, we, can, we can share the numbers and, and it will probably be, be ready in a couple of weeks, couple of months time maybe, but sharing the numbers and looking at the figures might not be the most informative thing I think to, to do. And how, how, let's how just have the discussion. How are the discussions within the association around, these, around this data you have collected? Interesting. I think uh, we have some new people coming into the uh, to the FA, which uh, which supported uh, the, the 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 conclusions from this from these analysis. So I think that's that's a positive sign. And and yeah, uh, cl uh, cl clubs like Willem II, they are they are starting to make changes, make informed changes to the way they structure their youth academy. So I think, uh, although uh, Bastian said baby steps, I think uh, at least we're making steps and that's the that's the positive thing about it. Really good. good. Yeah. Jace, anything from you, mate? No, it's been a great discussion again. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to go away and just reflect on on what's been said, what I've heard um and and maybe see what other golden nuggets i can pull out of this and and i'll re-listen back and, and and try and take some more knowledge out of it and, and move forward i just think there's so many great opportunities now to learn from others and to share information and share ideas oh, share approaches um it's actually quite an exciting time to be involved in football there's a lot going on in the world right now i mean obviously we've got wider uh concerns for sure and and our primary concern has to be everyone's safety but i think it's given us all that chance to maybe hit pause a little bit and to think and reflect on what we've done previously and and hopefully what we can do better coming out of all this when when normal soccer does resume so lots to think about um mark anything from yourself mate no i think it, this is great it's i like these conversations that just emerge from other conversations and uh it's it's becoming a very central team to this podcast which just basically emerged by accident from us having a conversation and so yeah it's it's really really beneficial for me actually i'm, I'm really enjoying this hopefully we can keep developing this britain um <clears throat> I keep going back to uh, this idea of being judged on the experiences of children. And as we're navigating, you know, coaching education and we're navigating, uh, you know, infrastructure and, you know, professional development and that sort of thing. Um, how many studies have been done on the experiences of children? 
you know, where is their voice in all of this? I, I don't think that we're there yet, but uh, I think I think it's going to be an important area to explore. Well, on that as well, Britain. I mean, uh, and I was going to mention it at the end. Um, I met yesterday um, with uh, Carl and um, Jennifer Turnage, um, Carl from Michigan University, and uh, their qualitative uh, research that they're going to be conducting uh, very soon. They're still looking for uh, obviously a wide range of data. They're interested, um, Jan, around you know the kids' perspective in Europe as well as in North America. Sounds good. Um, yeah. You know, Jace, I don't know if there's contacts that you have so we can get a, a, rather than just a Nova Scotia perspective and an Ontario perspective. Britain, obviously, you're in the US and it uh, looks like it's been driven by obviously Michigan. Anyway, if anyone's interested in that, I spoke to uh, Jennifer and Carl and they said that they're, they're looking for as many data points as they can grab. Um, and it's all qualitative. It's it's one on one. It's, um, you know, they're not going to be using numbers to, to try and uh, get the kids voice out. They actually want to chat with them. So. Excellent. That's cool. Really good. Excellent. All right, folks. Well, have a good day. Um, and again, uh, if uh, you're interested to come on a three P, just let us know. <laughs> <laughs> Always interested in discussions like this, Mike. <laughs> yeah. All right, cheerio, Great. folks. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thanks. Bye.